Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. We are having today the training sessions for newly appointed technical body officers of SEN and SENELEC. Uh, and this morning, you're in the you're joining the session of the uh, SEN standardization process. So I would like to welcome you all, of course, and remind you of the housekeeping rules. Uh, all attendees will be by default be muted, so you do not have the possibility to enter uh, to ask your questions right away, because we do expect a few people to connect this morning. But you can enter your questions in the Q&A panel of the webinar. Uh, the presenters will from time to time have a break and have a look at the questions and reply as many as questions as possible during the presentation. Should your question remain unreplied, please don't worry, because we intend for every session that we have today, by the way, we intend to make a Q&A report available via our website. So this morning's training session will be talking about the SEN uh, standardization system, and in the afternoon, you're still welcome to join the session on the SEN IT tools, followed by a session on the common SEN and SENELEC IT tools. Before we start, I would like uh, also to um, provide you with a little welcome message from our Director of Standardization and Digital Solutions, uh, Cynthia Miseroli. She could not be here with us this morning, but uh, we have a recording prepared for you that we would like, would like to share with you uh, as a welcome. So please bear with me, I will open it right away. Welcome everyone to this day, which is a day that is dedicated to you. Um, is really a day during which we would like you to take maximum advantage of the uh, knowledge that is uh, sitting in the San Serenac Management Center that is made at your disposal to give you some insight uh, uh, about the European standardization system. You are certainly part of it, but you are also new in this uh, in within this uh, responsibility so i hope that you really um take uh, as i said the full advantage that you enjoyed and you take the opportunity also to ask questions because while some of the sessions are uh, pre-recorded there is also the possibility for you to ask questions that would be addressed at the end of the of the day but first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Cinzia Missiroli. I'm the Director of Standardization and Digital Solution uh, within uh, uh, SENELEC. And uh, as such, it is the department that oversees uh, the, the work of all technical committees. And the people there are, they are uh, um, at your service to support you in your job, that is to develop uh, European standards and other deliverable for the benefit of the uh, internal market. And as, um, as I said, we are, you are part of the system, of the European standardization system, that uh, is key for ensuring that Europe is strong and that we develop standards fit for the purpose that are market driven, industry driven, but on the other hand, therefore, uh, that some of those also are fit to support uh, European legislation. SEN and SENELEC are, as you perfectly are aware, are two of the three European standardization organizations that are officially recognized by a piece of legislation that is a regulation 1025 of 2012 that defines roles and responsibility when it comes to uh, works related to um, uh, European standards in support of the single market. As you know, um, when it comes to standardization, there are three main layers. One layer is the national uh, member that you are part of it. And the second layer is the European layer. And we have a third layer that is the international standardization system. And as you know, we have agreement in place in order to uh, uh, deliver whenever possible one single global solution 
together with ISO when it comes to SAN and uh, IEC when it comes to SANELEC related activities. Of course, all members of SAN are also ISO member, as well as uh, all SANELEC members are uh, IEC members. SAN and SANELEC are a community, a community of stakeholders that are organized uh, by our national standardization bodies, national committees. SAN and SANELEC have each 34 members. In certain instances, those members are the same. For example, when it comes to the, to the UK, to Turkey, Romania, they are the same uh, organization. In other instances, those members are different. Uh, like, for example, in Italy, we have UNI for uh, um, SEN and CHE for SENELEC. Or, uh, uh, for example, Belgium and BN for SEN and uh, CBBC for uh, SANELEC. This is just in, uh, to give you an example of how different the, um, the national reality can be. But what is important that there is always a dialogue in order to define uh, a position that needs to be brought at uh, European level. The San Sanelec community, as I said, is a, is a community of people, is a community of experts that participate at European level, thanks to the member, in line with the national delegation principles. And we have many, mem many experts working in different, uh, at different levels. As a matter of fact, uh, within San and Senec, there are around 500, as you see here in this line, 478 active technical committees, each of them working in their field of competence that are structured in working groups. And um, as you see, we have around 2,000 working groups that are actually those groups within the technical committee that are responsible of the drafting of the European specifications. The work, of course, is it's, uh, very well organized according to the scope and responsibility of each of those groups. Not only the um, experts can participate uh, through the national delegation principles, but we have also experts participating thanks to liaison um, agreements that have been uh, put in place between uh, European federations and the relevant technical committees. We have also um, agreements in place with non-European countries that have the possibility also to contribute to the work of the technical committees and in particular also to implement the standards that have been developed at the European level. More and more, the, uh, the work of technical, uh, uh, technical level is becoming more complex. Uh, hence, the need uh, to uh, establish horizontal groups. Uh, and we have joint committees between the SAN and, and, and SANELEC to deliver those type of uh, documents. We have also um, groups that do not develop um, technical specifications or uh, European standards, but also a group that discuss future needs. And these are also becoming more and more uh, horizontal. Just to name a few, for example, those groups related to the smart meters, the smart uh, um, grids, uh, the uh, smart manufacturing, the cyber activity, artificial intelligence. Um, as I mentioned, more and more, we are going from vertical activities towards horizontal, uh, horizontal activities. We have a lot of uh, uh, experts joining uh, our activities uh, uh, Sorry, sorry, to sum up, we have a lot of experts joining uh, our activities, both uh, through the national delegation at European level in vertical technical committees, as well in on, uh, horizontal groups. 
why we believe this uh, this uh, training session is is important for you. Well, it, it will give you some basis related to the standardization uh, principles. It provides you with the latest development uh, uh, and uh, the impact that those will have on the technical work. And I will uh, give you some hints about um, recent decisions uh, that have been taken by the sun and sun like technical boards that have an impact on the rules and the way standards are drafted. It gives you the possibility to touch base with this your CCMC colleagues, even if virtually for this time around, and we hope to host you uh, next uh, next year in, uh, in uh, live uh, in the in a management center because it's always a good opportunity to uh, to exchange um, and get to know the get to know the people. Um, as I said, this time is uh, virtual, uh, but we hope that you, in any case, uh, get familiar with some of the of the people that will uh, make the presentations and um, that you can get in touch with them, if not during this day, also in the, in the months and years, so years to come. Uh, and then, as a matter of fact, the San Sanalek uh, Management Center and the people working there are really there at your, uh, at your service. Um, we have uh, you are your first line of, uh, of contact for any issues that might arise within your technical committees and please do not hesitate to contact us to contact uh, the relevant project management um, project manager uh, in case of need on support if you have doubts we are really there to help you and make uh, the successful ensure the successful delivery of uh, uh, European standards and the other deliverables. Um, of course, the uh, Science and Lake Management Center offer also the possibility for uh, uh, physical meetings. We have quite a, a, a good capacity for, uh, for that, and there is a possibility to book the meetings uh, online, but as you know, in this, during this time, uh, this is not really possible, but we will uh, um, uh, uh, put this uh, option again at your uh, disposal as soon as possible and as soon as COVID-19 allows. Of course, uh, uh, there is, and we also encourage the possibility to have uh, virtual meetings and we have a web conference uh, uh, system in place that you also can have access to it uh, through this, the link of this presentation, but of course also on our website. Site. And again, I do not hesitate to use this facility as much as possible. Here I have an overview of the um, of your day. Um, and uh, as I said, this is uh, a series of sessions that have been pre-recorded. Uh, and we hope that you can enjoy them nonetheless. This will remain available not only for today, but also for, for, the, for, for the future. So they will uh, remain as a reference uh, kind of uh, a tool uh, to, support, uh, to support your work. And of course, you can follow them according to your interest and according to your needs. There are some that are more um, horizontal and hazard that are more that are more sun or sun like oriented as, as you can see for example in the case of those related to the frankfurt and vienna agreements as uh, the as as i mentioned there are some parallel session because depending on the on the need that these are mainly uh, during the uh, the uh, the morning and then in the afternoon uh, it really focuses on the uh, SAN and SAN like IT tools. And then uh, we have the possibility to have a live uh, session with the question and, and answers. And we always appreciate to, to receive questions and to have this type of interactions because it is a bit more 
lively and uh, and we hope to be able to answer to your uh, questions if not immediately you will receive a, a response uh, in written afterwards i really wish you a, a fruitful training i know that is uh, not very common to have this kind of training organized online especially with this so such a full uh, agenda but I, I hope that you can take the, the best out of it and again please don't hesitate to reach out to your contact person within uh, the samsung like management centers should you need or should you have any uh, any question also in future thank you very much and again have a fruitful training Okay, for those who were just joined us a few minutes ago, for your information, we started this uh, session at 9.15 to have a little welcome message uh, um, that was pre-recorded, in fact, uh, from Cynthia Miseroli, as you have just seen. Uh, this complete set has been recorded as well, so it will be shared with you later on. Um, but without further ado, I would like to jump right away into the session. So I have the pleasure to have two of my colleagues connected today for introducing you the standardization process. So please, uh, Nuno and Thierry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Els. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, I do. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Nuno Pargana, and I am the account manager in the manufacturing team. So this means that I am responsible for a team of four sectoral project managers that are the main contact points with TCs in the fields of mainly in the fields of machinery, construction and chemicals. So this is the, the structure of the presentation for you to better understand the standardization process. First, I will go through the roles and responsibilities of the technical board, the technical committees and the working groups. Then we go through the development of the standards from the moment that the new work item is created until the publication of the standard. Then we will go through the day-to-day -day management of VN agreements for those standards that are developed uh, together with ISO under VN agreements. Then we'll talk about the harmonized standards, um, the basics for harmonized standards in view of their citation in the official journal. We will go as well through uh, BOSS, Business Operations Support System, which provides uh, very important information on for those that are involved in the development of uh, SEN deliverables. Um, and then we'll go through some useful information that are um, that can be very helpful for you, namely some links and also some contact points at CCMC. So I suggest to start with the roles and responsibilities of the technical board, the technical committees and the working groups. There are three decision layers at technical level. The first one is the technical board, and the technical board is responsible for the organization and the planning of the standardization works. The BT is responsible for the rules and procedures, and also for establishing technical committees with precise titles and scopes. Of course, when a technical committee is not needed anymore, the technical board is also responsible for the disband of that technical committee. The technical board may as well establish um, specific uh, working groups uh, that you can see on, on the right side of this diagram. These BT working groups, they provide advice and recommendations on a specific sector or field to the technical board. So for instance, um, we have the SEN Senelec BT working group 14, uh, on harmonized standards and the regulatory framework. So this group discusses uh, horizontal issues related to harmonized standards and make uh, and report back to the technical board or may recommend, a, uh, recommend uh, to take some decisions on this matter. We have as well another example of a BT working group. We have the sense and like BT working group uh, 14 uh, on rules and processes that discuss any potential uh, need for a new rule or for the revision of a rule and provides that recommendation to the technical board. 
Then we have, of course, the technical committees on the left side, and the technical committees are responsible, in fact, for the development of standards and for the coordination of the work. And we have the working groups, and the working groups, in fact, is where the standards and other deliverables are being drafted. So we have the reporting line. Of course, the working group reports to the technical committee, and the technical committee reports to the technical board. Uh, you should as well be aware that uh, on, we also have uh, subcommittees within the technical committees. Uh, they should be today considered rather exceptional. They are created whenever, uh, for instance, the work program is, is very large or when, it, when there is a wide range of different types of stakeholders. But um, the SEN policy today is not to create um, subcommittees uh, anymore. So we should stick to these three decision layers uh, at technical level, BT, TC, and working group. The technical board, the BT. On this slide here, you can see the composition of the BT. First, you have the chairperson, who is the SEN vice president technical. We have the chairperson of the BT Technical Committee Management Center that we, the acronym is uh, BT TCMG. So this, this group of, uh, of the BT was created to really uh, discuss mainly technical matters only. Uh, and it received a delegation from the BT to also take decisions. Uh, the BT TCMG is supposed to discuss technical matters like, I give an example, uh, overlap of uh, standards uh, or overlap of, uh, of TCs or other technical matters. So the BTTCMG is not supposed to discuss political or strategical matters. This is for the SENBT. Coming back to the composition, uh, the Secretariat is a CCMC. So the Standardization Director, Chinzia, who you just heard, is the, sec the official secretary uh, of uh, the BT. Uh, in terms of membership, is one representative per country, so one representative per national standardization body, and a number of observers are also part of the technical board. For example, ANEC, ECOS, SPS, and ETUC. We call them the ANEC three organizations of uh, Regulation 1020, 1025 from 2012 on EU standardization. They represent the consumers. Uh, environment, SMEs, and trade unions in standardization. They are observers. There are also other SEN uh, European partners that can also participate in the BT. And of course, the European Commission uh, is also an observer of the technical board. In terms of ways of working, uh, I would say that the most common is by correspondence. Whenever there is a need for uh, the BT to take a decision by correspondence, the ballot is open for a period of four weeks, but of course, during a uh, holiday period like Christmas or, or summer holiday, this deadline is extended to six weeks. And then there are, of course, a number of, uh, of documents that can be also submitted to the technical board for information or for consultation for, for comments. Uh, the SEN uh, BT uh, meets twice a year, and the SEN BT TCMG meets two times a year as well. So this a total of four meetings. Uh, you should also be aware that there are two meetings uh, between uh, the SEN and Senelec technical boards a year. We call them the BT common session meetings. And those are the meetings that normally the European Commission attends to, to report on EU policy basically impacting uh, standardization and also to give the opportunity to BT members and permanent delegates to ask the Commission some specific uh, questions they may, they may have. Now, in terms of responsibilities of the technical board, um, I already said that the technical board advises and decides on technical matters, um, particularly organization, overlaps between standards or, or TCs. Uh, whenever there is a need to implement a new rule or to revise a rule, um, the technical committee can also ask some exceptions to the technical board, for example, to deviate from the, from a rule, for example, to ask for a second formal vote that is not foreseen in the, in the rules, as you will see later on. Uh, so the BT might agree to have a second, a second formal vote in case there is a, a number of technical comments that you would like to take into account uh, in, in the draft standard. Uh, or for example, 
there is a, a need for uh, including very limited technical changes. There is also a procedure in place after the formal vote to allow the inclusion of, of those um, small technical changes needed. The BT is also responsible for uh, assessing and deciding on the creation of a new work items to develop new projects. But as you can see here on the slide, this decision has been delegated to the technical committee. So in fact, the approval of a new work item uh, is a technical committee uh, decision. Then the technical board may receive some specific technical uh, requests from uh, the General Assembly or the Administrative Board. And then uh, depending on the type of request, the technical board may allocate that task to a specific working group of the BT or can even create an ad hoc group of the BT to deal with that specific request. In case of, um, let's say there is an EU regulation that is being revised, impacting, of course, standardization, uh, it is possible that the technical board will be consultant, will be consulted for approving, for example, a position paper or a consultation to a public consultation on the revision of a directive or regulation. And as a general principle, the BT works by management by exception. So this is uh, the overall understanding of the BT as well, that whenever there is a need to deviate from a rule, and if it's well justified, the technical board is there uh, to, to make such kind of decision. The technical committees, the TCs. So as I said, the responsibilities of the TCs uh, are listed here on the slide. First of all, they are, they are established by the technical board with very precise titles and scopes. And the technical committees, in fact, are responsible for the development of the SEM deliverables. In case the European Commission issues um, a standardization request for the application, for the development of harmonized standards for the application of EU legislation, it is important that the technical committee assists CCMC during the negotiations of that standard, standardization request. And also that because that standardization request will include some deadlines to deliver the, the, the SEN uh, deliverables, normally standards, it is important that the TC also make sure that those documents are executed on time. In terms of composition, we have the chairperson and the secretary. We call them the TC leadership. We have the national delegations that have voting rights. So what happened is that the, 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 national, the, the national standardization body, the SEN member will nominate an expert uh, at national level that needs to be aware and follow the, the national position. And then this expert will attend um, the SEN TC meeting on behalf of that SEN member. And this is called the national delegation principle. Then European partners can also participate in technical committees. As observers, they do not have voting rights. So for example, an EU uh, association can establish liaison with the TC, participate in the work, um, can provide comments on the draft standards, for example, but they cannot vote on the approval of the standards, neither at inquiry or formal vote. The chairperson is appointed by the SEN technical board, but in the case of uh, SEN, this is a delegated decision to the technical committee. So what normally happens is that the, the member holding the secretariat of the TC uh, will put forward a, a, a candidate and then uh, it's the, the SEN TC then to decide to accept or not that candidate. The chairperson must be a neutral uh, in, in, within the technical committee. The chairperson runs the meetings and should try at all costs to have an unanimous, deci an unanimous decision. Whenever this is not possible, then they sh he, should, he or she should try to reach um, consensus and it is important to avoid that uh, the chair uh, has a voting during a, a TC meeting. It happens sometimes, but the goal is try to have unanimous decisions or reach consensus. Um, then the chairperson is the interface with uh, CCMC. Uh, so the chairperson needs to know from a technical point of view, needs to know 
needs to be aware of what is happening in the TC and in the working groups, not in great detail, but needs to be aware. And in case there is a need to discuss some issues with some external actors like the European Commission, for example, um, it is important that uh, the, the chairperson then presents the issue and understands as well the strategy to go. And also, if there are issues with other technical committees, um, the chair has also an important role of coordination and participation in that meeting in order to try to find a way forward to solve a specific uh, issue uh, that may exist. The secretary is appointed by the SEN member holding the secretariat of the TC. So in practice, this means that there is no need to um, take a decision to appoint the secretary. So what happens is that when a TC is being uh, proposed to the technical board uh, for being created, in the same decision, there is also uh, a request for the allocation of the secretariat uh, to a member. And then once the technical board accepts the creation of that TC and the, and the allocation of that uh, secretariat to a member, then the member will choose who is going to be the secretary. The TC secretary is uh, responsible for preparing and the, and the distribution of the documents. So, for example, agendas, uh, documents for discussion for meetings, uh, reports, uh, decisions. Um, it's important to, to highlight as well that the agendas need to be circulated two months before the meeting takes place and the documents for discussion needs to be circulated one month before the meeting takes place. And all these documents need to be um, circulated via the SEN document uh, platform that is replacing um, the live link e-committee that you may know as well. So basically we just followed ISO because ISO migrated from the live link e-committee to SEN documents, we followed uh, accordingly as well. The TC secretary, is responsible to ensure that the meeting is ran smoothly, um, that uh, the timetables agreed are followed. The TC secretary needs to be aware as well of the SEN BT decisions, but of course, CCMC will support you in that. Normally, in each plenary meeting, the CCMC project manager may attend the meeting to provide an update on the recent um, BT decisions, but of course, the, the TC secretary needs to be aware of that. Uh, just like the chair, the, the secretary is also uh, responsible for coordination with the, other, with the other TCs when needed. The TC secretary is the main contact point in the TC with CCMC. So the TC secretary is free to contact CCMC whenever there is um, a need to better understand the rules or, 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 or to provide some advice. And in case of standardization requests issued by the Commission and then accepted by the, the SEN Technical Board, the TC Secretary is also responsible to preparing, for example, the annual reports, uh, the work program, or uh, the final report. But of course, with the support of the experts in the TC, the, the working group, and also with CCMC, we can also support you with that too. So on this slide, you have a more graphical uh, explanation of, of the TC composition. Uh, as you can see on the left side, the secretariat is allocated by the BT to a member, and that SEN member will choose one secretary. The chair is appointed by the technical board, but as I said, in the case of SEN, it is uh, a SEN TC decision to appoint uh, the chair. Then we have SEN members uh, that have voting right, and each SEN member can appoint a max of three delegates, but it is important that one of these delegates is the head of delegation. So whenever there is a SEN TC plenary meeting, for example, uh, it is important that, that if there are three delegates attending that meeting, that one of them is the head of delegation that can vote to avoid that the same member votes three times, of course. Uh, then we have European partners that uh, are part of a TC as an observer uh, and the rights of European partners or how to establish liaison with the technical committee. Everything is defined in the sense and like guide 25 that you can hear that you can see here on the left bottom corner, the concept of partnership with European organizations and other stakeholders. 
Then you have as well ISO representatives. They can also attend uh, the technical committee meeting. Uh, for those cases where the technical committees work together with ISO on some projects, of course. Uh, affiliate standardization uh, bodies, they can also attend the TC uh, meetings, uh, but as an observers. The same with liaison officers from other TCs. So sometimes the work of, of two TCs can be quite close and there is an interest to nominate experts from each TC to attend the other TC to, to, to follow the work, but also to, to report. I, I give you an example. So for example, the SEN TC cement and the SEN TC concrete products are very close to each other. So uh, they have nominated experts to attend the meetings, the, the TC meetings. And then, of course, the European Commission is also an observer without voting rights. Uh, from my experience, I never seen the European Commission attending regularly a SEN TC meeting, uh, meetings. Uh, however, the EC desk officer at the Commission might be invited to attend a specific uh, TC meeting in case there is a need, for example, to discuss, I don't know, uh, harmonized standards uh, or to discuss the development of a standardization request or even to discuss the implementation of a mandate or a standardization request. The working group. So the working groups are uh, created by the technical committee. Normally they are created for a short term task to prepare the first drafts of standards, TSs and uh, TRs. Uh, the, they, they have in terms of composition, the, individual, the convener and the individual experts and those individual experts they are nominated by the national standardization bodies and they are there in their personal capacity so they need to be aware of the position at national level but they are there as experts in a specific uh, field of course if they are not aware of of the of the position at national level there may be a risk later on that the standard do not go through the inquiry of uh, or um, or the formal votes. At least, uh, it's important that these experts are aware of the national uh, position. Then, of course, the working group convener, who is um, chosen according to a TC decision, uh, so it's the TC that decides who is going to be the convener uh, for a specific working group. The convener is sort of the leader of the working group uh, and the, the working group convener is responsible for normally writing um, the, the drafts and also sending the drafts to the TC secretary when the documents are ready. Of course, in this case, uh, with the support of the working group um, uh, secretary. Uh, the working group convener needs to ensure that the working group uh, experts know um, the rules and procedures. So in this sense, it is important that uh, the convener knows the internal regulations part two and part three, um, and also the rules that are described on the SANBOSS website. And of course, if there are doubts, then CCMC can assist with that. Uh, the working group convener needs to actively uh, report uh, to the TC on, on the progress of the work. Normally this happens in the TC plenary meetings. There is always uh, a part for the working group conveners to report on the progress of the work. Uh, however, of course, a working group convener can report more actively than once a year when the plenary meeting takes place. It can also uh, report more regularly, circulate the reports to the TC secretary that then can circulate via um, via the send documents platform. So this is up to the to the TC and the working group to decide how and when is the best time to to report. The working group convener also, uh, whenever there is a need to to have some support from the TC leadership or uh, the TC in general, or whenever there is an issue, it is important that the working group convener goes back to the TC leadership for for such support. Uh, there are uh, two BT decisions that are quite important about uh, the meetings and how to run a meeting smoothly and success success successfully. We have a BT decision about uh, the code of conduct for experts participating in SEN and SENELEC technical work. Um, so 
basically is, is just um, a reminder to the experts that when they attend a technical committee meeting or a working group meeting, they need to work with a clear objective and, and scope. Um, they need to participate actively. They need to work on the basis of consensus that they participate in order to, to make things move forward and to progress the work and not to block the work and also to behave ethically. And then the BT also approved um, the best practices for improving the effectiveness of the working group meetings. And basically this document is very useful for working group uh, conveners. It's basically a, a, a reminder or a checklist on, on a number of aspects that the working convener needs to be aware. Uh, for example, to send invitations uh, to, to meetings on time together with, with the agendas two months before the meeting takes place. Also the, to send the documents for discussion well in advance. Uh, prepare the reports um, on time after, after a meeting takes place, uh, agree uh, during the meeting, agree on actions and who is doing what by when. So it's quite important as well to write down those actions and to agree on deadlines. Uh, and also at the end to at the end of a meeting to agree on the on the next steps uh, to follow. So we could have, uh, if there are a few questions uh, in the chat, I can see that uh, there are only two, two questions. Well, there is a question from uh, Karen. Can you act? And if so, how if the agendas or the documents are too late? I would say that, and also in the, in the internal regular, if we're talking about working groups and uh, Thierry, do you want to answer that? I can see that. You would like to answer this live? No, 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 no. Go ahead. I'm just yeah. repeating the question. Okay, thanks, Thierry. Um, so basically, in the work, in the internal regulations part two, is very clear that um, for uh, working groups, uh, it is possible to um, deviate from these established deadlines of uh, two months for the agenda and one month for the the documents for discussion. It is possible to deviate from these deadlines as long as there are no issues from the working group members. So if all the working group members agree that they need to shorten some deadlines, and then there shouldn't be an issue. However, if the working group members do not agree and the documents are submitted um, quite late, two or three um, days before the meeting, it is possible that uh, then um, the, that the, the, the working group will not be able to discuss such a documents in a meeting that was discussed quite, uh, quite uh, at the late stage. And then there is a, a question of, that Thierry is answering, but I can also tackle that one. Is there a maximum of time a person can be a working group convener? So the first nomination uh, can be for a period of six years, uh, and then it is possible to continue uh, to have um, nomination after the, the six years mandate expires, that person can continue being nominated and appointed uh, convener, but for a period of max three years. So each time after the six years, you can have three years and then three years and then three years. So there is not really a, a limit uh, as long as the TC agrees. The only difference is that the first time it's possible to have a nomination of six years and after that only three years. Uh, there is a question that uh, about the tasks uh, of uh, the working group secretary. It is uh, it is true that it is not included in in the in the presentation. Uh, very often uh, it happens uh, that uh, there are no working group uh, secretary in a, in a, in a working group. Uh, it is important to always have uh, professional standardization support provided by a member to a working group. And normally this should result as well in um, the appointment of a working group secretary. So the working group secretary basically needs uh, together with the, if there is one working group secretary, he or she is responsible, for example, to the circulation of, uh, of the documents, the agendas, the, the minutes, uh, making sure that the, there is a circulation of, of the documents via the SEN documents uh, specific area for the specific area um, of uh, the working groups. Um, 
the I would say also that the, the working group secretary could assist as well, the working group convener in the formatting and the editing of uh, the document. Uh, the working group secretary, if the convener agrees, should be the person uh, to submit the, the documents uh, after editing to the TC uh, secretary as well. So basically, it has some of the same tasks as the TC secretary, but more at working group uh, level. So I hope this, uh, this answers your questions. Yeah, Karen, I, sorry, uh, maybe I replied just about the working group, um, uh, the working group um, circulation of documents. I would say that is quite important in a TC meeting to circulate uh, the documents on time. Um, so especially the agendas and uh, the documents for discussion. If at a meeting, it happens that the document is circulated beforehand, uh, and if the members do not oppose to discuss that document in a meeting, um, that's, in my view, that could be some flexibility. However, if in, you are in a meeting and someone is complaining uh, and saying that, look, you didn't circulate this document on time, I refuse to, um, to discuss this document, uh, then according to the rules, that person has the right to make such a comment and the suggestion would be then to discuss that document in a next meeting maybe you could circulate a document uh, via send documents and then uh, provide some um, some comments um, online via yeah via, yeah online and then discuss uh, in, a, in a specific meeting uh so there is a question, maybe the last one, because we, I guess we should move on to ensure that we are not late. Uh, can you explain more about the individual experts? Uh, they are there on personal load exactly, but they need to, to know the national position. Are they always member of a national dinner committee? Are they obliged to consult opinions to report back to the working group? So I would say that, uh, yes, they need to know the national position. They need to be aware of the national position, uh, but they do not, needs to act according to the national position but if they don't do that there is always a the possibility that um that yeah that the draft will receive a negative vote at uh, at national level so that's why it is very important um in terms it is the national standard i don't remember anymore the question disappeared what was the uh, um yeah, they normally need to be members of the national. I would say that it's up to our experts, but normally they need to be members uh, of, of the National Mirror Committee. This would be, I think this would be the common practice, but this is something that happens at national level, so we don't see it. But I, I think so, yes, that they need to be members of the National Mirror Committee. Uh, and I would say that is important as well. There is no obligation from my point of view that they consult opinions, but I think it's important that they attend um, the national media committees to understand the different views when when they are uh, discussing in the working group uh, meeting at TC level. But there is, I, in my view, there is no obligation that they need to consult opinions because they are in the same TC working group meetings in their individual in their individual capacity. Let's put it this way. Uh, I would say that reporting them back to the working group would be a good practice from um, from these experts attending the same working group meetings even though I don't think there is any obligation on that. Uh, so last question, uh, and I will, uh, then I will move on uh, from uh, Maya. Um, is there a limit of uh, the term of the chairman or the same as convener? So it's exactly the same as the convener. So the chairman is appointed for a max period of six years. The first time, it could be less than six years, could be even two or three years. But uh, after the first uh, appointment, when the mandate is over, successions of three years are possible as well, but no longer than three years each time. So I suggest then um, to, to carry on to the next uh, part of the presentation. So the second part of this presentation is about um, the procedures for developing uh, a standard from the moment that the new work item is created until uh, the moment the standard is published. There are four types of uh, SEN deliverables. We have European standards, we have technical specifications, 
technical reports, and we have as well the SEND workshop agreements, also known as the CWA. Um, the first three deliverables, they are developed by the technical bodies, while the SEND workshop agreement, they are developed in a workshop. And the focus of this uh, presentation will be on European standards uh, that are the prime deliverable of uh, SEND. On this slide, you have um, the different uh, steps for the development of standards. Uh, the first one is, of course, there should be a proposal that must be assessed and then decided upon by the technical committee. Then we are in the stage of uh, drafting the standard by the TC experts and the stage of building consensus. When this is done, the standard can be submitted to a public inquiry. After the closure of the inquiry, we are in the stage of consideration of the comments received uh, during the inquiry. After that, uh, the document can be submitted to a formal vote for uh, the approval of the standard. And then at the end, we have um, the stage of finalization or publication of the standard. So the proposal can really come from anywhere. It can come from existing technical committees. And I would say that this is the most common origin for, uh, for proposals. It can come as well from European Commission. So as I said earlier, in the case of um, harmonized standards, so the commission can issue a standardization request to SEN. If it is approved by the, by, by the SEN technical board, it means that uh, we are requested to develop harmonized standards in support of EU legislation. The proposal could come as well from uh, national standardization bodies, so directly from the SEN members. And the proposals could come as well from the SEN partner organizations or uh, the SEN uh, liaison organization. So as long as these organizations have a liaison status with the technical committee, they can make proposals as well uh, for the development of, uh, of a standard. So, uh, once this uh, proposal is submitted, uh, it must be assessed. So is there really a need to develop such a standard? Is it feasible? Is it possible? Are there enough resources to develop uh, such, such documents? Uh, it is important as well to consider national legislation to see if there is a need uh, for an A deviation. And an A deviation is basically um, it's normally in the shape of an informative annex uh, in the standard, and it's, um, it's included in the standard, for example, after a TC decision when there is uh, some clauses of the standard that um, conflict with, the, with national legislation. So it is important to already look at these aspects when making a proposal. Another point that is uh, very important is to ensure that the proposal uh, is not conflicting or in the scope of other TCs, or uh, it, and it's important therefore to look at the work program of other TCs to make sure that is not already covered um, elsewhere, this proposal. Then there should be a decision to develop uh, a, a standard, and this could be done through a new work item to develop a standard or through a preliminary work item. The, prelim the preliminary work item have a, a lifespan of three years, uh, and normally it's used when uh, the draft is is quite is not mature enough, and the, and the TC is not sure whether they can um, they can comply with uh, the submission deadlines that uh, are associated with the new work item. So they might go with the preliminary work item, and then during the development uh, of the document using the preliminary work item that TC can decide within these three years to activate the preliminary work item into a new work item. So the creation of a new work item um, is a, a decision that must be uh, done uh, by correspondence through the committee internal balloting, the CIB, for a period of two months. So the ballot is open for two months. Uh, this means that the creation of a new work item cannot take place during a SEN TC meeting. It always has to be done by correspondence via CIB for a period, a CIB that is open for two months. Then there are 
two conditions for the approval of the new work item. The first one is that uh, at least five members are willing to participate actively. That's the first condition. And the second one is that you need, of course, to have a positive uh, vote. Uh, with regards to the positive vote, weighted vote applies when uh, the proposal is for development of um, a new standard or a new TS, or for the creation of a new work item for revisions or amendments of standards where there is no change of the scope. So in this case, the weighted vote applies. Simple majority vote applies when we are talking about creation of a new work items for the amendments or revisions of standards where the scope do not change. Do not change. So the scope remains the same. And if this is the case, uh, a simple vote majority should apply. So what does it happen if uh, the vote is positive, weighted vote or simple majority, and you do not have five members willing to participate in the work? Every now and then this happens. Uh, so either the new work item is not created. This is one of the options. Another option is that the TC may consider to, instead of developing uh, a standard, to go ahead with a technical specification proposal for development. And the third uh, option is that, exceptionally, the technical committee may put forward a request to the technical board for a derogation of the five members rule. It's important to provide a justification explaining why. Uh, and if the technical board then agrees, it means that the work item can be created. Um, preliminary work items, they can be created during meetings. However, uh, they need to be announced two months uh, before the meeting takes place and they need to be uh, included on the agenda as well. And the new work item form for this preliminary work item needs to be as well um, circulated uh, two months before the meeting takes place together with the agenda. So these are quite important. I would say that it would always be better to, even for a preliminary work item, to go with a vote by correspondence via CIB, because then you know you, you can reach really everyone. And sometimes at the meetings, you may have uh, some uh, experts uh, from NSBs not attending the meetings. The use of the new work item form is uh, mandatory. On the right side, you can see a print screen of the new work item form. Um, for your information, the technical board recently approved uh, a revised new work item form. Uh, we will present uh, these uh, these new BT decisions next uh, next uh, tomorrow, and we will include this information as well. Uh, in the new the new work item forms need to be filled by the working group convener together with the support of the working group uh, secretary, and the information inside this new work item form need to be very complete and very precise. For example, you need to indicate what kind of deliverable you are dealing with, um, what is the scope, what is the justification to, to start working on that standard. Uh, you need to indicate, for instance, what is the standard that is being superseded. If this project is for the development of an harmonized standard, it is important to indicate the links with you regulation. So you should indicate what is the standardization request and uh, applicable and what is the EU directive or regulation applicable, uh, among other, other important aspects. Uh, once the, the, the CIB closes and if the vote of, for the creation of the new work item is positive, this means that the TC secretary will have to register the work item on projects online working area. So there is as well some user guide information available on the sandbox for that. If you have some IT issues, you can contact as well CCMC. Uh, another important item is that if the work item is accepted after uh, the closure of the CIB, this means that standstill applies. So at national level, the national standardization bodies cannot start working on any project that conflicts or overlaps with the project that is being developed at EU level, at TC level. Uh, 
And another important information I almost forgot is that when the TC secretary is launching um, the CIB for the approval of a newer CARAM, is mandatory to include as attachment the newer CARAM form in PDF format. So when you are ready to submit your document to CCMC for inquiry, there are a number of uh, documents that we need from your side. The first one is obviously we need the draft standard in Word and PDF formats. We need as well the transmission notice uh, that you can see here on the on the right side, and you can download these documents from um, the the Sandboss page. Basically, is a document that you fill and you inform us what kind of document and for which stage uh, we are talking about. So for example, you indicate that is a standard and that you're submitting to inquiry. You may also uh, add the information about um, the mandate and the EU regulation if it's in, in the case of uh, harmonized standards. Um, so in addition to the transmission notice, uh, the drawing uh, files in TIFF or EPS format need to be submitted as well. Uh, if we are dealing with an harmonized standard, you may want to submit to CCMC um, supporting uh, documents, uh, for example, justifications to be submitted to the to the Haas consultants or to the European Commission when they are um, assessing the standard for citation. Uh, for instance, um, in case again of harmonized standards, the table of comments of the Haas consultants with the last column field on how the TC has addressed the comments from the consultant. So these are examples of uh, types of documents that you may wish uh, to submit to us. Uh, and of course, in the transmission notice, uh, there is a box at the end, as you can see here, additional information in case you want to communicate uh, anything um, to us. Um, for example, in case uh, you want, imagine a series, um, a parts of a series that are develop, being developed uh, at the same time. And let's say you want to inform us that you would like that um, all the inquiries of that parts of a series are, are launched at the same time, or all that parts of a series are published at the same time. So this is the kind of information that you may uh, want to add in your transmission notice. But if it's very important, I would also, in addition to this, I would also advise you to contact uh, CCMC project manager or the production team, so you can uh, explain your, yeah, your your need to have uh, certain standards published at the same time. For example, so the public inquiry. Um, so as I said, when you are happy with your uh, draft uh, document. Um, you can submit the document to CCMC for starting the inquiry procedures. CCMC has five weeks for the in-check and the editing of the standard. So the in-check basically is a, a sort of a quality check um, that we do just to make sure that um, the images have the right uh, format and quality, that you, you use the right formulas, that you use the send template uh, document that is already styled and formatted. So this is the kind of check uh, that we do. And once this is done, the, the document is submitted to uh, the editor, to the, CCC, to the CCMC editor uh, to edit the standard. After these five weeks of in-check and editing the standard done by CCMC, we will request translation uh, normally, normally to AFNOR and DIN because the, normally the standards are developed in English. Uh, and those case, the translation is to French and German. And AFNOR and DIN has eight weeks to translate the standards. After those eight weeks, we will launch the public inquiry that lasts for 12 weeks. So this means that at national level, uh, the national media committees need to discuss uh, the draft document, uh, whether they can be uh, accepted or not and provide and discuss the comments to submit uh, as well. So it's an important stage to build um, the position at national level and then the, the NSPs will cast their vote within these 12 weeks. Uh, then after the closure of the inquiry, CCMC, well, there is a tool that will collate all the comments and calculate the voting results. 
and then CCMC will submit, will will dispatch these uh, these comments and the voting results to the C, to the TC secretary. So now we are in the stage of closure of the inquiry. So between the closure of the inquiry and the submission of the document to formal vote, this stage is, is called consideration of common stage. So basically what the TC needs to do is uh, analyze all the comments received, uh, received and also take a look at uh, the voting uh, results and to, to check if it's positive or not. Normally a TC would need to organize, uh, to organize a comment resolution meeting to discuss those, uh, those comments. If the TC wishes to skip formal votes, uh, this is possible under certain conditions. The first one is that the weighted vote is positive. In case of harmonized standards, you need to receive a compliant Hans assessment results. And if these two criteria are met, this means that the TC will have to take a decision. In this case is a simple majority decision. Um, and if the vote is, uh, of the TC is positive, this means that the standard can proceed directly to publication. But there is a catch. There is a catch because remember that if you do that, technical comments that were received at inquiry stage cannot be taken into account in the document. Only editorial comments are allowed. So I would say that the most common procedure is the one described on the right side. There are a number of technical comments received during inquiry that are important to be discussed and to be integrated in the standard. Uh, and once the TC working group revises the standard accordingly, um, then of course um, the TC, uh, the, the working group convener and the, TC, uh, and the working group secretary eventually could submit a document to the TC secretary to start the formal vote uh, procedures. So the TC secretary may need to still do some sort of editorial check of the draft document. Um, and once the document is submitted to CCMC, uh, similar steps as we did at inquiry stage will follow. Uh, so we will do again a, a sort of in check, so a sort of quality check on whether the images and other elements are are were correctly done by the TC. If not, then we will uh, basically reject the document and request the TC to correct them. Uh, but if everything is okay, then uh, my colleague will will transfer the document to the editor to edit the standard, and the editor has five weeks to edit the standard. Uh, then. And this is a uh, <clears throat> this is a decision that was uh, was changed in a BT decision that was changed in 2020. So before the editor had two weeks to edit the standard, and now it was extended to five weeks uh, because it has been very challenging to edit the standard in two weeks because there are always some exchanges with the technical committees. Uh, so more time was required. So the editing is five weeks. The translation into French and German is five weeks as well. And after these five weeks, CCMC will launch the formal vote. And the formal vote will last for eight weeks. Um, and this is a stage, of course, where the, the national mirror committees uh, need to discuss the final draft that was submitted to formal votes, uh, discuss and, and build a position, and then cast their vote accordingly. It is important also to, to highlight that both the votes at inquiry and formal vote are a weighted vote. So this means that 50 votes percent of the votes must be in, fav in favor and 65 of the population, uh, meaning the weighted vote, um, needs to be uh, reached to approve the European standard. And if you have doubts in the future uh, whether any decision is a weighted vote or a, a simple majority vote, the answer is very clear very easy. So you just need to go to internal regulations part two, clause 6.1.4. And if your case is not covered in that list of eight or nine cases where weighted vote applies, then it means that it's just a simple majority vote. So just for information. Uh, in terms of still weighted vote, if you consult internal regulations part two, you can see uh, the weighted vote that is allocated uh, per, per member. Uh, the weighted vote is, is basically uh, 
a calculation of the GDP for, uh, and uh, the population of the country. So yeah, so with this um, with this table you can understand uh, the different weights, uh, and of course the total must of of each weight must be one hundred percent. Okay, now there is a, an important uh, BT decision that I would like to share with you about the handling of the formal vote uh, comments. Uh, so basically the BT decision uh, states that after the closure of the formal votes, only obvious editorial errors and errors introduced by CCMC can be considered. So this is really in the past, uh, it happened uh, not very often, maybe, but it happened that sometimes there was an exchange between the working group convener and the CCMC editor on what is uh, an editorial change and what is uh, a technical change. We do understand that sometimes there are change, there are errors uh, that happen accidentally in, um, in 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 the draft. For example, uh, the change of a minus to a plus in a formula. This might be a small mistake. However, it has it's not editorial because it has a technical impact, such a mistake. So that's why in this BT decision, it, there is a sort of definition what is an obvious editorial error. It's an error that is recognized immediately and without any doubt, uh, both by the CCMC editor and the TC secretary. Then the BT decision includes uh, also import other important aspects that uh, after uh, the formal vote during this TC proofing, so it's a stage where the TCs validate the final uh, document to be published. If we do not receive any reply from, um, uh, from uh, the TC side, from the TC secret secretary side, or even the working group convener in some cases, in theory, CCMC can proceed to to publication of the document. But since this BT decision entered into force, I never saw a CCMC going to publication without the validation of a TC. I don't think we ever did it, but in theory, this is possible. Then uh, the BT decision also says that the CCMC editing after the closure of the formal vote is two weeks and the TC proofing is also two weeks, but this TC proofing can be extended to three weeks if the TC um, requires more time. And we are also uh, quite flexible um, during the, the holiday period. We understand that could be some delay. So we are flexible with that. Honestly, this is the longest BT decision I've seen uh, in my life. Uh, another point is that uh, if there is an issue between uh, the TC and the CCMC editor, then it is possible that we will need to involve the technical board. But as I said, so far, this was never raised to the BT and there is always a solution found between the TC and the CCMC editor. Uh, so the TCs are invited, of course, to deliver a text of uh, with the highest quality possible. And in case it happens that after the formal vote stage, uh, there are a number of limited technical changes that need to be included in the standard to prevent the incorrect application of the standard, there is a BT procedure. There is a procedure in place that requires BT approval uh, for such inclusion. So if you need, um, if you are in this case, then you may just contact the CCMC project manager uh, to see what are the options to allow, to see if it's possible to allow such uh, technical changes in the draft standard. So this is it. Um, moving to the publication uh, stage, which, uh, which is also called the finalization stage. Uh, basically, uh, CCMC is responsible for, as I said, final editing of the standard, submitting to the TC for uh, TC proofing, and then requesting after that requesting a final translation of four weeks. Uh, after that, we 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 publish the document. Well, we don't really publish. It's kind of published at EU level, at SEN level. But what we do is we make the document available to our SEN members for national implementation uh, publication. This is what it means. Uh, in case of harmonized standards, uh, we need also to provide uh, the translated titles to the European Commission because in the official journal, the European Commission is translating um, that document into all EU official languages. So it is important that we submit as well the translated titles to the Commission. Our members have the obligation to publish standards as uh, national standards and withdraw any conflicting uh, standards that they have. 
um, this means that one standard at EU level will be the same in 34 uh, countries, which this is one of the power of standardization, of course. As I said earlier, the standards are developed in uh, English, French, and, and German, and then members and members can decide at national level to translate as well uh, the standard uh, into their national languages. Now, if we talk about uh, maintenance, um, we have amendments and corrigendas, and we have as well the systematic review. Uh, the amendments basically are, are produced to whenever TC sees the need to, to modify some specific parts of the text only without going through uh, the whole text. Um, so it is important to highlight that only the amendments are vote. If a TC decides to go ahead with the amendment, only the amendment is being voted, not the entirely text of the standard. Of course, at the end of the procedure in SEN, we will consolidate uh, the documents. So the mother standard and the amendment will be published all together. Uh, amendments are only possible for standards that are less than four years old. If a standard is four year, more than four years old, it means that uh, if there are some modifications needed, it means that a, rev a revision is, is the only option. Um, and in case of amendments, the normal procedure applies. So this means that there is a need to launch a CIB for the creation of a new work item, and then the normal track applies. So the inquiry plus the formal vote. Uh, Corrigendas. Uh, Corrigendas are, in my opinion, a bit tricky because remember that uh, Corrigendas are not voted by, by members uh, as an amendment or a revision or the development of a standard. So there is no inquiry, there is no formal vote. So um, it should be used very carefully, uh, normally to correct mistakes that will lead to the unsafe application uh, of, uh, of the standard. So it's a request that you, you can put forward to CCMC uh, and CCMC can advise you on whether you should, that the core agenda can be applied or whether, or rather is better uh, that, you, that you go with a normal amendment or, or revision of the standard. Please be aware that the goal of the core agenda is not to correct normal uh, technical errors, but really to errors that can lead to the unsafe application of the standard. Then we have the systematic review. Uh, every five years, um, um, we launch, uh, an, it's an automatic uh, process. We launch this um, systematic review. It's a, basically a, a consultation uh, to check with, uh, with the TCs um, what, um, what should happen with the standard? So normally in this systematic review uh, questionnaire, there are uh, a number of questions. Should the standard be confirmed? Should the standard be um, withdrawn? Or should the standard be revised? It is important that this is to note that this is just a consultation. So the result of the systematic review does not mean a decision. So the TC will have to follow up the outcome of the systematic review with the TC decision. And in some cases, I, I, I remember in some plenary, plenary meetings I attended where the result of the systematic review was, for example, uh, to confirm. And then following the discussions of, uh, of, of that uh, outcome of the systematic review, the TC decided to go in a different direction. For example, to launch a CIB for the revision of uh, the standard. So, and as I said, if the outcome of um, the systematic review is a revision, this means that you will have to launch uh, uh, a CIB for the approval of a new work item um, for the revision of certain standard. And of course, the normal track applies. So inquiry plus formal vote. And again, at any time, if there are no technical comments and if the vote is positive, there is always the chance to speed up the process by skipping the formal vote. Now I'd like to, uh, to briefly talk about the flexible standard development process that is applicable as of April uh, 2019. Um, the BTs approve uh, this uh, these new process that is applicable to SEN homegrown standards 
or send standards under the Vienna Agreement with send lead. So this means that the flexible standards development process do not apply to send work items under the Vienna Agreement with isolate. So in this case, the ISO processes and, and timelines basically apply. So this was put in place, this system, flexible system was put in place to really to give the opportunity to the technical committees to decide how much time uh, they need for, um, for the development of the standard. On the slide here, at the bottom, you have different links for webinars on the flexible standard development process. So if you have some doubts, uh, you are invited to, to listen to the recording, um, but you can always contact the CCMC project manager or myself in case you have any questions about this uh, process. Just to highlight um, that in the past, before the flexible standard development process, the, the system was quite, quite static and rigid. So this means that in total, the TCs would have 68 weeks to develop the standard, uh, divided equally into two parts. So the stage A was 34 weeks, and the stage A is the stage for the TC experts to draft the standard. And the stage E was also 34 weeks. And that's the stage for drafting the standard after the comments received from inquiry. And the stage B, C, and D and F are either internal processes or voting processes where the timeframes are established and they do not change. So this was fixed. Uh, and the idea with the flexible approach is that the TCs still have the same number uh, the same total number of weeks, which is 68 weeks to develop the standards. However, the TCs decide how much time they want to allocate to the stage A, which is the drafting of the standard, and the stage E, which is the handling of the comments from the inquiry. So this, the only restriction that is in place is that for stage A, the TC needs to allocate a minimum of one week, and for stage E, the TC needs to allocate a minimum of six weeks. And this is the theoretical time that you need. The six weeks is a theoretical time that you need after the closure of the inquiry to deal with the comments received. So as an example, this means that in theory, in theory, you could have for stage A, one week, and for stage E, 67 weeks. So this is possible. So really, within the 68 uh, weeks, you choose how much time you need for stage A and for stage E. So this is the, the main principle, to be more flexible. So what is important is that um, when the working group convener, with the support of the working group secretary, is filling the new work item form, it is very important to indicate the target date to dispatch the inquiry document to CCMC and the target date to dispatch uh, the, the formal vote document to CCMC. The target date to dispatch the first working draft is half of the target date to dispatch the inquiry to CCMC. Um, and then after the working group convener submits uh, this uh, new work item form to uh, field to the TC secretary, what is important is that the TC secretary goes to projects online working area fills all the fields that are in the new work item form in the project online working area tool. And then the document is saved and not submitted, saved and you generate a PDF. And once the CIB is launched, that should be the PDF that is attached to the CIB. And the project online working area, as you will see in the, in the next slides, is very useful because the TC secretary can see very clearly the time allocated uh, between each of uh, the stages. So this is what I just said. So the working group convener needs to fill in the new work item form in section 19, the target date to dispatch the document to inquiry, dispatch the document to formal vote, first working draft and the project start date. So this needs to be filled. So it is important, of course, um, that you discuss these dates as well with the working group uh, experts. Then in projects online working area, and now this is a task for the TC secretary. 
in section 17 of, um, of the registration of the work item, you can see that there are three fields that are editable. On the right side, you need to indicate the project start date. And then you need to indicate as well, there are two fields in white and the rest in gray that you cannot edit, you cannot insert dates, but you need to calculate, uh, sorry, to insert the dispatch inquiry draft submission date. And you need to submit as well, insert below the, the target date to dispatch the formal vote draft to CCMC. And this is just uh, an example. Once you insert these dates um, in these three fields, this means that the tool will automatically calculate um, all uh, the other dates. And this can be very useful for you because you can see in the, in the last column, you can see precisely the number of weeks allocated uh, between the different uh, stages. In this particular example, uh, it was used um, 34 weeks for stage A, which is the drafting, and 34 weeks, which is um, for stage E, handling of the comments of the formal vote. Uh, at any time before the dispatch for inquiry, if uh, the working group sees that uh, they need more time, for example, uh, to submit um, the document to inquiry, uh, the TC leadership together with the working group convener have at their choice uh, some options for changing the plan, the planning. The first one is it is possible to apply a one change option. And in this case, there is no need to have a TC decision. It is enough an agreement between, between the working group convener and the TC leadership. But there is for this one, there is an important aspect. Let's imagine that um, <clears throat> you allocate a certain time for submitting the document to CCMC for inquiry. And then you see that you need, for example, one or two more weeks or one more month. If you apply this one change option to have this one additional month, this means that you are removing one month from the next stage of handling the comments from, uh, the, uh, for, from the inquiry. So with this option here, the one change option, you don't really get additional time, but you can transfer time from one place to the other. However, if you see that you really need more time, um, then the only option is to ask for a tolerance of 39 weeks, which is uh, normally the nine months tolerance. And remember that in this case, um, a TC decision uh, is, uh, is needed. Now, very briefly, there are other types of uh, deliverables, uh, not only standards. We have, uh, according to different needs, we have different deliverables. We have technical specifications, technical report and send workshop agreements. I will go very briefly, uh, because as I said, the focus of the presentation was on uh, European standards. Uh, technical specifications are, are normally created uh, when um, there is no really a support uh, to develop uh, an European standard, when there is a doubt on whether consensus was uh, achieved, for example, to develop a standard, or when uh, the subject matter is still under technical development. So one of the big differences is that there is only one vote for technical specifications. So we don't have the inquiry and formal vote. We only have uh, one vote, but the approval of the standard is also by weighted vote. However, there is no, nas there is no obligation to withdrawing national conflicting standards with the TS. So from the moment that the new work that, that the new work item is created, the TCs normally have 12 months to, to develop the TS. Then there is a period of three months and a half for editing and translation, three months voting, and then three months for um, editing and translation. If it happens that there are technical comments after this vote, this means that um, they cannot be taken into account. And uh, in very exceptional case, if you need um, a special procedure, I would just invite you to, to discuss with a, with, a CCC, with a CCMC project manager to see what, what options are, are available. Uh, and again, the total max time to develop this um, TS would be 21.5 months. Normally a standard is between two to three years. So it's a much faster procedure as well, the TS. The TR is an informative uh, document. Um, so it means that it cannot contain in theory uh, technical uh, requirements, 
So for example, a shall should not be included in a, in a TR. Uh, it's an informative document, for example, uh, for used for collecting data that was obtained from a survey, from a survey or um, to collect some statistical data. So in principle, uh, once a new academy is created, um, TCs would have 12 months to develop uh, the document. Then the editing time is one month. So translation is not foreseen, as you can see in comparison to the TS. Then the vote is, um, is three months. Uh, again, similarly to the TS, there is only one vote, not inquiry and formal vote. And then at the end, uh, there is one month and a half for the editing. And uh, this deliverable is um, made available in theory even faster than a TS because the max total time to development, to its development, it's 17 and a half months. The SEND workshop agreements normally are, are used whenever there is an emerging or completely new uh, technology or whenever um, there is a need to develop something um, as a result of a research project or even to develop something as a tryout to develop a standard where there is no, it's not mature enough to go with a standard, it's possible first to go with the with SEND workshop agreement. Um, in terms of uh, participation, the, the workshop agreements are extremely uh, flexible, so it's possible to develop uh, the workshop agreement um, at any stage during its development. Is You have direct participation, so this means that the NSBs do not have to uh, appoint uh, experts, so companies can participate uh, directly, and is open to all basically to all the, the globe, so any European or non-European um, company or organization can participate. Uh, and basically, there is no vote um, for the approval of, of the of the SEND workshop agreement document. Uh, there is basically an agreement of the participants. And um, of course, it is advised uh, to have an inquire, inquiry, even though it's not mandatory, it is advisable to have an inquiry. Uh, in terms of... Um, of a uh, lifespan. So once the, the workshop is agreement, it has a, a lifespan of three years uh, that can be then extended to, uh, to another three years, so max six years. And this means that after these six years, uh, there, there, is, there is a need of a decision on whether the workshop uh, agreement needs, can, be can be transformed into another deliverable. Otherwise, if that's not the case, then uh, it needs to be um, deleted, withdrawn. So I have one last slide uh, as, a reminding for, as a reminder for the drafting and the editing and the publishing. Uh, so for the drafting of standards, the Bible basically is sentencing like internal regulations part three that provides the rules for the drafting of um, European uh, standards and other deliverables. Um, it is quite important that you use the same simple template for drafting standards. It includes already the right formatting and the styling. So I included here on the slides the, the links to the BOSS website, so you can, uh, you can download these documents. Uh, we have also organized uh, recently a, a webinar for uh, standard uh, drafters. Uh, so it took place on the 2nd of December, uh, and you have here a link to the recording and the presentations uh, given uh, at the meeting. So, and if you have any doubts, I would say do not hesitate to contact uh, the CCMC project manager. They will get in touch as well with, uh, with the production team. And if while during the drafting of the standards, you have some questions, you can always contact the, the editor directly. And uh, sometimes we also, uh, if you feel that is necessary while um, drafting standards in the working group, we can also invite uh, an editor to participate in that meeting to help you with some drafting groups. So that is also possible and we are more than happy, happy to, to do that as well. And uh, that was it from my side. I don't know if there still are some uh, questions. I've seen uh, Terry answering a lot of questions, so thank you for that. Great. It was very helpful. Uh, I see still three questions unreplied, so I'm not sure if they were already answered orally or should we tackle them now? I, I suggest yeah, I can. we can. Yeah. We still have two minutes, uh, 10 minutes, sorry, before the break. So I understand that looking at the question from Karen, Karen uh, 
we are talking about the outcome of a systematic review that is a revision. I'm, ass I'm assuming that. And if there is a CIB for uh, the revision um, and that it, there are no enough uh, experts um, or NSBs willing to appoint experts. So in this case, in this case, the TC needs to, 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 to see what are the options on the table. I would say that if the CIB for the revision of the standard is positive, but not enough members, uh, one of the options is of course to ask the technical board for a derogation of the five members rule. Uh, so this is one of the options on the table. Uh, another option is that um, the TC sees that the new work item was not uh, approved because of lack of experts. And there is a possibility to move in a different direction. And the options on the table are confirm or withdraw. So these are the two options on the table. So for example, confirm seemed to me maybe uh, if no one voted withdraw, confirm may be a more suitable um, option in this case. Uh, but again, either request a technical board or uh, for a derogation of the five members rule or maybe confirm the standard would be uh, would be the, the most uh, appropriate uh, way forward. So there is a, a, a question from uh, Charlotte um, about, uh, so where in projects do you register a preliminary, preliminary work item? So projects have an area to which CCMC do not have access, which is projects online working area. Um, and so this is a, an area, it's a working area for TC secretaries only. So the experts of TCs and TCMC do not have uh, access uh, to this area. I'm not sure exactly what it is, to be honest, because I, I, I don't have, in my tool, I don't see the, I don't, I don't see this option. It's but just I'll, somewhere on top, if I can intervene. I think it's somewhere on top, yeah. 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 There and is then, a recording, by the way, about projects online working area. I will share it in the chat well, in the QA. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. if you have doubts, you can always uh, as well uh, check the guide that we have on the send boss, as El just said. And um, again, there you should be very clear once you enter that area, uh, it should be very clear where you can, uh, you can register the preliminary work item. There is a, a question from uh, Christina uh, Novali. Can a TC decide during a meeting to confirm a sent yes uh, or, a, or a standard without having done before the systematic uh, review with the CIB? Um, well, I would say the other way around uh, that you can first always revise a standard or a, or a TS before the systematic review. So this is possible and this will cancel the launch of, let's say that after three years, you see the need to revise a standard. Uh, so once you revise the standard, that systematic review will not be launched, will only be launched once the revised standard is published and five years later. Uh, what you can do is if the outcome of the systematic review is confirmed, uh, I would say that that decision could be taken at the meeting. So you have the outcome of the systematic review and then at the meeting, you take a TC decision to confirm the TS or confirm, um, or, or confirm the, the standard. So you cannot really anticipate with the decision, the confirmation. So to directly reply to your, to your question. Okay. There is a question from uh, Jennifer uh, to clarify uh, a revision amendment with the same scope. Do you only need a decision approved by a simple majority? You don't. You don't need to follow the five uh, countries rule. Uh, so partly. So partly is yes and partly is no. So this means that when there is a, a CIB ongoing for the creation of a new work item, after the closure of the CIB after two months, there are two conditions for approving the new work item. The first one is you always need, regardless, you always need five members willing to participate in the work and you always need a positive vote. Now, if it's a weighted vote or a simple majority vote, depends on whether 
it is a revision of a standard or amendment where the scope is changing or not. So if it's if there is no need to change the scope of the standard, a simple majority vote applies. That must be, of course, uh, positive, more than 50%. And you always need the five members uh, willing to participate in the rule. So this is, uh, this is uh, always the case. Uh, there is a question from uh, Alexander uh, about the steps for submit. I, I understand submission of uh, of uh, documents. Uh, so I would say that in SEN, you do not need to submit any document uh, via email. Uh, so what you need to do is, when you are ready with your uh, with your draft uh, document to be submitted for inquiry or formal vote, you just need to. Use the transmission uh, interface, which is uh, eTrans. I'm sorry, I probably forgot to mention this during during the presentation, but that's correct. You just need to submit the document via eTrans, and then um, the the document together with with the supporting uh, documents, the the images and, and everything via eTrans. So there is no need to send uh, the application of uh, of uh, of the standard via via email. So just eTrans is sufficient from our side. Uh, yes, there is Harald about the five members rule. Um, yes, exactly. So if, if, if the votes of the CIB uh, for the creation of a new work item is, uh, is positive and um, there are no enough members, it is possible that the technical committee requests um, a deviation or a derogation, a derogation from the five members rule, but it's very important that the technical committee provides uh, a detailed justification so the technical board then can decide uh, based as well on that particular justification of the TC. I can give you an example that I had uh, recently. Uh, so the vote was positive, but there were only three members that were willing to participate in the work. And the justification was that the, the the standard the the project the project was or the product was so niche in Europe that there were only three countries producing that that product so the other countries uh, were it's not that they were against they just didn't have the need or the experts uh, so that's why they didn't nominate anyone so in this case you know to help SMEs for example uh, the technical board uh, agreed with the creation of uh, of that work item even though there were less than five members available. Then there are some questions about uh, about ISO, and I would suggest um, that I take a look at these uh, at these uh, because also it's break time that we take a look at these um, these questions, and we will reply later on. 